Well, today we're wrapping up a collection of talks that we've been calling Christmas carols. And we've been taking popular Christmas songs that we sing every year and probably use as the background and the backdrop of our Christmas season. We play it on Pandora or Spotify or iTunes and all those things. And we just listen to them. We don't even know. They're like, oh, I like that song. That's a good one. Oh, I heard Nat King Cole singing it. Oh, there's Bing Crosby. There's Frank Sinatra. All these, you know, great Christmas classics, the Carpenters. And we don't ever think about it. And we don't understand the rich biblical principles and meanings behind the songs that we sing. And we've been using those songs to help teach us and remind us of the Christmas story. So in week one, we talked about O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. How from the end of the book of Malachi in the Old Testament to the beginning of the Gospels is one page turn for us, but that page that's blank represents 400 years of silence that God didn't speak, there wasn't a miracle, there wasn't a sign and wonder, nothing. And a group of people had been long awaiting a Messiah and had thought, well, God's forgotten about us. And the song is written from that place of the people of Israel, that desperate cry, O come, O come, Emmanuel, God with us, ransom us, save us, send that long-awaited Messiah we've been desperate for. And that's why we sing that song. Remember, I brought the table out last week, and it was blank and empty. And I said, that's what it was like, 400 years of silence. But then God finally spoke again. And he spoke through the angel to go and tell Elizabeth and her husband, you're going to have a son. His name will be John. He'll be the forerunner. He will prepare the way, Zechariah. Remember, Zechariah didn't believe. God shut his mouth until John was born. At the same time, the angel appears again and tells Mary, a young virgin girl, to fulfill prophecies. You're going to bear a son. And he will be God's one and only son. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, Mary wondered how that worked biologically. She went, well, I understand how this thing works and how God designed it, and I've never been with a man. He said, don't worry, the Holy Spirit will come over you. God will fill you with his son, and you will carry a child. And she goes, then fine, let it be unto me as you have said in that moment, God and Mary conceived Jesus in that moment. So then we sang the song in week two, What Child Is This? Written from the perspective of the shepherds who show up at a stable behind the, an overcapacity inn that wouldn't have been this beautiful wooden structure that we all see. It really would have been like a part of a cave that was kind of carved out on the side of a mountain from weather and water, and it would just would have created a little bit of a covering for animals to be under, to get out of the elements. And it was there that God chose to allow his son to enter the world, in Bethlehem, to fulfill the prophecies once again. And he was born in a stable on a bed of straw, not the way that everybody else thought. Remember, they all wanted him to come in royalty and in a palace with a big parade and fanfare, and that's not how God did it. And the first people to meet the Savior besides Mary and Joseph were shepherds in a field nearby. Remember that we told you the cool thing about those shepherds were Bethlehem was six miles south of Jerusalem. Most scholars believe Jesus was born during Passover. Wasn't born in December. I don't want to ruin your Christmas. He wasn't born on December 25th, just so we're all clear. We celebrate Jesus' birthday. Fine. We celebrate that it's not his birthday. He was probably born sometime in late March, April, around Passover. And isn't it amazing that the shepherds working in that field had one job? They were the shepherds for the Passover lambs, the pure, spotless lambs that would be sacrificed during Passover. And it was those shepherds that God said, leave the Passover lambs and come see the one who's been born that will be the eternal Passover lamb, that you will need no more sacrifice. Those are the shepherds that came and knelt down and met the king of kings. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King. That's who it is. That's who it, that, they, they came and celebrated and worshiped, but it didn't make sense because he didn't come the way they thought he would. He didn't come with fanfare and he didn't come with royalty. He came lowly and humble because remember, Jesus' whole life modeled humility. A humble birth, a humble life, and a humble death. You want to be like Jesus? Get humble. Quit puffing yourself up and thinking you got it all together. You want to get high? Get low. That's how this thing works. That's how God's always worked. You want to be raised up to places of leadership, places of authority, places of influence? Then get yourself low and serve somebody humbly. That's what he modeled. And then last week, I ruined everybody's nativity scene. Because you love it, and you've got the shepherds and the baby, and it's so great. I just became Bill Cosby in the middle of that for some reason. You know, the shepherds were all good right there. It's so weird. But, but all of a sudden, we have these three, these three kings. We sang the song, We Three Kings. Most miss quoted song ever. One, they weren't kings. We learned that they were magi from Persia. Persia is 1,050 miles away from Jerusalem. The star didn't appear in the sky until the night 
Jesus was born. I don't know about you. It's hard to travel 1,050 miles with camels in one day. They didn't get there the night he was born. So all your nativity scenes are wrong. I told you, set it up over here and put the wise men way over here on this side of the table. So when people walk in, they go, why are they so far apart? Every inch of the table represents a month. That's about how long it would have taken for them to get there. Most scholars believe at best they were there day 41 of Jesus' life. That's why Matthew 2 says, and they came to the house where the child and his mother were. Not a baby, where the child... Most scholars believe he was somewhere around 18 months to two years old. By the time the wise men arrived, that star stayed in the sky. It guided them there and it rested over their house. Remember, they went to Jerusalem first. They didn't even go to Bethlehem. They thought, well, he's got to be in Jerusalem because, again, fanfare, royalty. He's the king of the Jews, right? Here we go. Herod goes, no, 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 I'm the king. So go find the baby in Bethlehem and tell me where he's at so I can worship him. I'd love to worship him too, a.k.a. kill him. So when they go there and the Magi, the wise men come and they bring their gifts. Remember, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because he was a king. Frankincense because it represented his, his, his priestly ship because incense rises to God as a sweet aroma. And then myrrh because it represented the death that he would one day have. It's an embalming fluid. Remember I told you when they mixed it with wine, it became the gall that he was offered on the cross. Every gift had a purpose. Not only to represent his life as God, as our high priest and the death for the sacrifice for our sins, but also it provided the income they needed to sustain them until they got established in Egypt. Because they fled. Because Herod then killed every child two and under. Hence, two years old and under to cover his bases. Every boy born from then down was killed. Joseph and Mary flee to Egypt with their child. So it fulfilled the prophecy that God said, I've called my son out of Egypt to lead you. It all has a purpose, right? So that's the Christmas story. We think, yeah, we sang these songs. There's the Christmas story. Nobody talking, void. We need a Messiah. The Messiah comes. Shepherds are there. Wise men are there eventually. There's the Christmas story. And today I chose a song that I think is vital that represents the most important overlooked part of the Christmas story. You and me. We just sang the song, O Come, All Ye Faithful. Why did I choose that song? Well, because I think this was the main song that drove the whole series for me. So I was listening to Christmas music, I thought, there's an interesting thought process in this song that nobody talks about, that I really wanna help you with today that I think is gonna change your perspective on Christmas a little bit. Look at how the verses go. They say, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. And then it says this, O come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him. O oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. The next verse says, Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exaltation. Sing, all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. And it says it again. O oh, come, let us adore him. And look what the third verse says. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus to thee be glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. And then it makes that statement again. O oh, come, let us adore him. We sang that song, and it was actually originally written in Latin, and it was called Adeste Fidelis. That's what it meant. They took that, and they took those original four verses from the Latin, and they expanded it to eight. We're not going to go over all eight today. But there's one key thing that happens in all eight, but I want to talk about that in a second. Most of us attribute it to various authors. John Francis Wade, John Reading, or King John IV of Portugal, all were said to have translated or helped write this song the original four verses of the hymn were that. Now, we also know that the O Come All You Faithful that we did, or that's done most, was an English Catholic priest named Frederick Oakley, written in 1841. That's the most widespread version that we sing. But here's what God struck me with as we think about this song. It says, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. Every time, three times at the end of that. Every stanza. If you sing all eight verses, 24 times you make a declaration, O Come, Let Us Adore Him. If you repeat it, you could sing it up to probably 30 times. You'll make that one statement. There are not many songs we sing in the church where we repeat a phrase like that that many times. O come, let us adore him. It got me thinking. You know, we, we use that word a lot in our culture, but not the way that it was intended. The word adoration literally means this. It means a deep love and respect. It can mean worship and veneration, which all veneration means is to have great respect. So when I have adoration, I have a deep love and a respect. I worship and a great respect for things like that. 
every person who's a part of the Christmas story does this. Mary, adored. Mom's in the room. You know that moment when that baby's born and they lay them on your chest for the first time. I don't care if you have adopted a child. The minute you hold your child for the first time, moms, there is something that happens that only happens between a mother and their child. It doesn't happen with a dad. Dads have a moment too, but there's nothing like that moment. I watched it five times with my wife, four times as she gave birth, a fifth time as she held our son, the moment the legal system said, you can now hold him, he's your child, when we adopted Judah in the hospital, the first time she held him. There's an adoration there. There's a great love and respect for Joseph in the story. He stood by and he adored a child that wasn't his own. That he became, quote unquote, a stepdad. Can we give a shout out to all the stepdads in the room? Come on real quick, somebody. Step parents in the room who love a child and nurture a child that's not, quote unquote, your biological child. I'm grateful that I have a second dad. He's been in my life for almost 30 years. So I, I'm grateful for, for, I don't even call him stepdad. He's just dad number two. I, I, got, I got blessed with two dads. So he's just an amazing guy, but Joseph's that guy. He's the forgotten guy in the story, but he has adoration there. Oh God, that you would choose me to be a part of this. Now he was thinking, I'm going to divorce this girl and I'm out. I'm just going to keep helping keep face. Then the angel told him, no, no, you got a big part to play in this. The shepherds came and adored him. The wise men came and they fell on their face and they adored him. But we've used that word and made it so cheap now. I just adore those boots. So cute. What an adorable child. Just, he's a cutie. What a, he's so adorable. Like, oh, I adore a good chocolate cake. Oh, I just adore it. Like, we think about that. Girl, I adore those Uggs. They look great. Does anybody even wear Uggs anymore? Is that even a thing? I have no idea. Not up on fashion. Maybe they are. I don't know. But you're like, oh, I adore those. those are true. And, and we just throw it around. Oh, I adore you. If you read the Song of Solomon, which is quite a racy book in the Bible, but if you read it, it's a, about a man and a woman's relationship, but there's a lot in there. Oh, I adore you. Oh, I do. And we use it as this infatuated, oh, this is adoring. And that's just not the way that it was supposed to be when we think about it like this. That's a specific adoration that should be given. And I want to help us grasp this today. When these hymn writers chose that phrase that you sing 24 to 30 times, if you go through it, there was a reason behind it. Because there is this posturing of ourselves that what am I called to do in this Christmas story? My job is to come and adore Jesus. To come every, every day, every moment, every minute, especially at this time of year that we celebrate it, and adore him. To give him adoration. The word adore pops up throughout scripture in different places. I want to show you how it carries weight. To adore God is a, is a posturing of our lives and worship. Look what Psalm 5-7 says from the Passion Translation. But I know that you will welcome me into your house, God, for I'm covered by your covenant of mercy and love. So I come to your sanctuary with deepest awe to bow in worship and adore you. In worship so that I can just adore you, God. That's what we're called to do. There is a place where I come and I fall at his feet and I worship and I adore him. I think this is important to grasp this morning. The shepherds bowed in worship. The angels bowed low in worship. The wise men fell on their face and bowed in worship to God. They adored him. They gave him everything. Look at what Jesus says about worship and how his disciples should respond. Remember, he meets the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He said he had to go through Samaria. God doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. He went there because there was a woman waiting that needed a touch from him. And he met her there. And look what happens in the interaction. She's asking, well, where do we worship? Some say on this mountain. Some say in Jerusalem. And Jesus is going, no, no, no. It's not about a place. It's about a posture. That's what worship is. It's not a location. It's a position of your heart. Look what he says in John 4, 23 from the Passion Translation. From here on, worshiping the Father will not be a matter of the right place, but with the right heart. For God is a spirit, and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. That's the kind of worship he wants. Will you come and adore him? Have great respect and great honor for him. The disciples learned this in living life with Jesus. They learned what it meant to truly adore him, to worship him. That's why in Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, it says this, then all the disciples crouched down before him and worship Jesus. They said in adoration, you are truly the son of God. They knew a 
posturing of themselves and a positioning of themselves of adoring and adoration and giving him all that was due his name. And it was a posturing not only of their hearts, but literally of their physical being to crouch down and to do that. When Jesus arose from the grave, he appeared to his disciples numerous times. And in one of those occasions, in Matthew chapter 28, it says this, along the way, Jesus suddenly appeared in front of them and said, rejoice. Come on, somebody this morning. You need to hear that over your life today. Why don't you rejoice this morning? Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look at what you're going through. Take time to focus your attention on Jesus and rejoice and praise your way through it. Get to it. It says rejoice. They were so overwhelmed by seeing him that they bowed down and grasped his feet in adoring worship. It's how they worshiped. It's how they positioned themselves. And when I was reading this, I was struck by this constant reference of bowing down. Of bowing down. I don't know about you, but I don't take that posture very often. But yet, all throughout Scripture, it was the posture people took. The disciples fell down, grabbed at his feet, worshiped him there. When we read the story of the three wise men, the Magi, remember, they're not even Jewish believers. But the minute they walked through the doors of the house, something about the presence of God forced them to their face and worshipped him. Like there's this posturing of getting low. Remember, getting low and humbling myself and worshipping before God. It's why in most cultures it still happens. In Japan, there's this bowing culture. This bowing down is a sign of respect and reverence. When you become before royalty, you're called to bow. To show that you are beneath them. Now, God's not doing this because he thinks you are nothing, and he wants you. That's right, you get on down. It is a position of honor to go, God, you're so worthy of my worship. God, this is all for you. God, I am beneath you. Nothing comes except it's from you, God. All good and perfect things flow down from you. Can I just bother you real quick this morning? Some of y'all are trying to get blessed up. It doesn't work like that. The blessings don't come up. The blessings come down. Come on, that's not even in my notes. That's called a Holy Spirit moment there for somebody. Quit trying to get on a ladder and get blessed up. Come on, Jesus. I'm up here, man. Let the blessings flow up. No, the blessings flow down. And in order for them to flow down, you got to get yourself beneath Jesus. The moment you think you're above him and you got this going on, get ready for the blessings to stop. The flow doesn't work up. It works down. So I'm telling you right now, for me, I constantly want to get low. God, let the blessings flow. Let them flow down. That's what they constantly are doing in here. Getting low. Getting low. A physical act of bowing. There's probably a moment for us we need to do that. It used to be I did that in the mornings. I actually put my Bible under the bed. I heard somebody talk about doing this. So that I had to get out of bed and get down on my knees to get it. And guess what? While you're down there, you might as well pray. You might as well. Well, let me start the morning here. Too many of us, man, this is what we started doing. We got that digital Bible. Roll over. And you're like, I'm, I'm reading the word first thing in the morning. It's on Instagram. I'm just reading it here. That's what you're doing. We're going to talk about it on Christmas Eve. This becomes the first thing we reach for. I actually now put this on a dresser in the other side of the room. So it forces me to get out of bed to go get it. And all I do is cut the alarm off, and then I walk to my word. That's what I do now. I leave it there. Because let me tell you something. You want some blessings. You want some direction. You want some guidance. You need to disconnect from that and connect right here first thing in the morning. Connect here first. Why don't you get a word from God, not a word from Instagram? Not a word from email. Get a word from God. And you only get that word from God when I get right here. When I just get down, okay, God, you're so worthy, Jesus. You're so worthy. Lord, you're so good, Father. I just want to posture myself here. Let the blessings flow down because that's what it says. Bow down and adore him. Adore him. The word adoration shows up three times in the book of Revelation. Three times in the book of Revelation from the amplified version of the Bible. Look how it's referred to every time. Revelation 13.8 says this. All, somebody say all, all the inhabitants of the earth will fall down. You ain't got an option. One day, will fall down and how? Adoration and pay him homage. One day, everybody's going to bow down and you're going to have to adore him and worship him. He's asking you to freely do it now. <laughs> it's like, you can freely do it now, Christina, or he can force you to your knees one day. You can either freely, I'm going to like, I'll freely do it. 
It's in there. This is his word, not mine. Look what it says in Revelation 14. And he cried with a mighty voice, revere God, give him glory, honor and praise and worship for the hour of his judgment has arrived. Fall down before him. We're on our knees again. Pay him homage and adoration and worship him who created heaven and earth, the sea and the springs, the fountains of water. Once again, get down, worship him, adore him. Look what it says in Revelation 15. It goes on to say this one. Who shall not reverence and glorify your name? O Lord, giving you honor and praise and worship. Here it is again. For you only are holy. All the nations shall come and pay homage and adoration to you. For you just, for your, your just judgments, your righteous sentences and deeds have been made known and displayed. He's saying that like you're going to have to adore me. Adoration is an act of me giving all honor, all praise, all glory to his name. And I worship him. This morning, I want to show you something really cool. I love that sometimes God will speak through his word. Sometimes he speaks through people. He likes to speak to his wife, to my wife a lot to me. Come on, somebody, man, just listen sometimes. She knows it all, all right? Come on, in Jesus' name. No, sometimes it's good. Well, I, she knew what I was preaching on this week. She said, hey, I wanted to share something that God just revealed to me in his word that I think is really cool in Proverbs. So I read it, and then I realized, man, there's something really cool that comes when I posture myself in adoration. God actually promises some things when I do that. You ready to learn this morning how you can posture yourself and what you're going to receive? Guess what the first thing you receive when you posture yourself in adoration? You receive wisdom. You receive wisdom. When I posture myself in adoration, I will receive wisdom. Not worldly wisdom, not business wisdom, not financial planning wisdom. Like all that stuff flows from one source. I receive wisdom from God. And guess what? When I get that wisdom, all the other stuff works out. I know how to run my business better. I know how to manage my finances better. I know how to be a better husband, a better leader, a better dad. I need his wisdom, not worldly wisdom. And when I posture myself in adoration, he guarantees I get to receive wisdom. Well, how, Matt? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 3. So many of us are familiar with Proverbs 3 because we love 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. We stop there. Come on, man. I'm trusting in Jesus. But then he asks you to do something in verse 7. Look right here. And don't think for a moment you know it all. Come on, somebody. The word will just tell you how it is sometimes. Trust in me and don't think you know it all. Please don't, because you do not. For wisdom, look here, comes when you adore him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that's wrong. Listen to me real quick. Wisdom comes when I adore him. Undivided devotion. Let me tell you what that means. That's where in Revelation it says, I need you either hot or I need you cold. Don't be lukewarm or I will spew you from my mouth. I need you, listen somebody, either get hot or get cold. Too much lukewarm going around right now. The church has gotten real lukewarm and I'm telling you right now, we cut the burners on, we boiling in here. I'm not trying to get lukewarm in this church. Let's get hot for Jesus real quick. I'm not trying to be undivided. Let's adore him. Let's worship him. Let's preach his word. Let's disciple people. Let's help because it matters because wisdom comes when I adore him. But guess what it says after that? Not only that, look what verse 8 says. Then, another promise, you will find the healing refreshment your body and spirit long for. Come on, that's so good, somebody. Think about that this morning. He promises you, you get wisdom. It's a two-fold act here. But guess what the first part of it is? The first part is an adoration. What was the first part to get the wisdom? Don't think you know it all. Humility. Humble yourself. Again, get low. Humble. Bow. This is all for you, God. I adore you. And then guess what happens is you begin to position yourself correctly. God, I need your wisdom. God, I need your direction. I am giving you all praise. The blessings flow down. He begins to download wisdom. Okay, I'm supposed to make that decision. Or I need to turn there where I was going to turn there. Okay, I got it, God. I'm going to position myself there to receive full wisdom from you. And look what it goes on to say in Psalm 111.10. It says this, where can wisdom be found? It is born in the fear of God. Humility. Listen to me. We got this backwards. This isn't I'm afraid God's going to strike me down with a lightning bolt. 
Oh, I'm so I'm scared. It's not scared of God. The fear of God is what we actually translate into a reverent awe of him. Again, positioning myself. God, you're so worthy. And underneath him, a reverent awe. Everyone who follows his ways will never lack his living understanding. And the adoration of God will abide throughout eternity. Once again, the wisdom flows and the adoration comes. Like we're adoring him and that's where the wisdom comes from. We got to grasp this this morning. If you're looking for wisdom, start there. There's an understanding of living a life postured in humility and worship to him and adoring him. Wisdom flows. But that second part is vital for somebody this morning. He also says you will receive healing, body, and spirit. See, I think too many of us are only looking at healings when it comes to well, I, my leg was broken and then it got healed or I had cancer and the cancer's gone and those are great. Remember, we've taught this numerous times here. God heals four ways. He heals instantly. We're always praying for that. Believe for the miracles. He heals instantly. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes he heals gradually. It takes time. But it's a progression and it eventually comes. You hear somebody say, man, I went through the process and I did all this and man, three months later, I fully got my healing. You heard Aaron share that story earlier. I've been praying for the same thing month after month after month, and then the breakthrough came. Sometimes it's gradual. Sometimes it's medical. Please go to the doctor. In Jesus' name, please go to the doctor. A lot of people go, well, God will take care of it, man. I'm not going to go see the doctor. I mean, this lump on my side has grown four sizes in the last week, but I'm not going to go. Well, that's weird. Please go to the doctor, right? Because sometimes he heals medically. You hear people talk about, I went through chemo and I went through radiation. Was it hell? Absolutely. But guess what? I'm cancer-free in Jesus' name. Like sometimes he heals medically. But then the last one we don't like a lot, he heals eternally. And sometimes the answer is, come home. This week, there was a tragedy that happened with a worship leader from Bethel, Kelly Helgenthaler, and she, their two-year-old daughter, Olive, went to sleep and did not wake up and was pronounced dead. And the Helgenthalers, while she lay in a morgue, rallied people and asked, believe with us for a resurrection. We serve a God of resurrection. Believe he'll raise our two-year-old daughter back to life. She's got life to live and things to do. And uh, we saw the world unite. Now we saw, so interesting, we saw people become cynics of it. And they weren't non-believers. They were church folks. How dare you pray for something? That's so weird. Not going to happen. That's what happened. But isn't it interesting that the only reason you're saved and the only reason I'm saved is we serve a God who was resurrected. So resurrection, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So people rallied. Five, six days praying for it. They're now planning a memorial service for her. So here's what you have to understand. Sometimes he heals eternally. But I pray for the miracle. I'm not going to stop season. But here's, let me tell you why, why that, that story moved me so much this week. You serve a supernatural God, which means nothing about your life should be normal ever again. So I'd start praying for things that ain't normal. Why well, pray for stuff that I can actually see happen? Well, God, I just prayed that my car gets home. It did. Wow, great prayer. Thank you. That's great. And sometimes you need that. If it's all empty or whatever. But how about you go, God, you know what? I believe you can raise the dead back to life. You raise Lazarus back to life. Raise that little girl up off of bed. Come on, why not? That's the God we serve. So you pray like that. You can see it. Healings, body and spirit. That spirit part's important though. We want the healing of the body. The healing of the spirit is vitally important. Some of you in here have got wounds and you've got places in your past that have been beaten and shattered. And that's not a physical healing. You need a spirit healing. You need something to come inside and touch your spirit. That's why it says there in Proverbs 3.8, you'll find healing and refreshment for your body and spirit. You feel worn out. You feel beaten down. You're downcasting your spirit. You are having a hard time lifting your head. Hear me this morning. There's healing for your body and your spirit. Can you praise him? Can you give him adoration? Can you bow down and worship him? Give him all the glory to his name. Look what it says here in Ephesians 5.2. It says this, and continue to walk surrender to the extravagant love of Christ. For he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love for us was pleasing to God like an aroma of adoration, a sweet healing fragrance. When I get a life of adoration, there's a sweet healing fragrance that follows that. So when a life is fully surrendered to God in full adoration, I begin to see a posturing where I can receive the blessings to flow down. Wisdom flows down. Healing flows down. Life flows down. So here's the good news of that this morning. When I bow down like this and surrender to God, oh God, I just want to give you all the glory. 
God, I want to come and adore you right now. God, I adore you. I adore you. We sing it. I adore you, God. Christ the Lord, I adore you. God, would you just, I need some wisdom. God, I got some decisions to make in finances or with my job or with my marriage. And God, you know, with my children, I need some wisdom, God. And I don't, I'm not trying to get it from anywhere but you. So God, illuminate your word to me. You just begin to posture yourself like that. God, you know, I, my physical body needs a healing. I need a spirit refreshment and all these things. As you begin to pray in this posturing like that, when I begin to stand up, I stand up a different way. I stand up rejuvenated. I stand up ready to go. Okay, God, I, can I just encourage you, church? What would it look like to begin to posture yourself that way this Christmas season? I asked you throughout the whole series, are you desperate for a Messiah? It's what Okomo Kim Emmanuel is about. Are you desperate for a Messiah? Are you okay with God not doing things the way you want him to? What child is this? Are you okay with him not doing it exactly how you think and how you portrayed or how you thought? Are you okay with that this Christmas season? Are you willing to come and lay your gifts down before him and worship like the Magi did? Are you willing to come and bow and give him your best and your gifts and lay them down at his feet? And let me ask you this morning, will you adore him? Like, will you truly adore him and worship and get low so that he can lift you up this morning? That's my heart's cry for all of you. You know, we got some really fun things coming up as the year starts. We always begin the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'd love to see 100% participation this year. I'm not saying you have to Daniel fast, which a lot of us will do. I'm not saying you have to do a full whatever. I'm going to go straight liquids. You need to consult a doctor or whatever it is. Like maybe you're going, I had one guy tell me yesterday, he goes, I know this sounds funny, Pastor, but I got to give up YouTube videos. And he named one other thing. I was like, that is not, he goes, in social media. I was like, man, I love that. Whatever it is, fasting is a positioning of, again, God, I'm giving this up so I can receive all that you have for me. The bad thing about your phone is it will tell you now. He's like, dude, I looked the other day. I had been on YouTube for eight hours in a day. I was like, bro, you got a problem. No, that's what I didn't say. You have a serious problem. But it tells you now on your phone. You want to look where your time's going? Hit the little screen thing on an iPhone. Screen time. It'll tell you what you've been spending it on. It's a very humbling experience. You're like, wow, I have wasted a lot of time today. It'll tell you quickly. Get low so God can lift you up. So we want to encourage you to join us in that. But here's a statement I want you to get in your spirit as we wrap up today, as we get ready for 21 days of prayer and fast, and we're going to end 2019 strong, get ready for 2020 to be the best year yet. Come on, somebody. Listen to me at Limitless Church and in your life. Prayer is our first response, not our last resort. Prayer is the first response, not the last resort. And that only comes from a posturing of myself as my first response. I worship you, God. I need you, Lord. And prayer becomes that. This morning, let's come and adore him. And we're going to do that in a special way. We're going to come to the table and take communion together. It says in the Bible that the night Jesus was portrayed, that he gathered with his disciples in an upper room, and they shared a meal together. And at the end of that meal, he took bread and he broke it. He said, hey, this is my body broken for you. This is what it represents. I'm the bread of life. My body's broken. Take this, and every time you do it, remember me. Hey, adore me. Worship me. That's what we're doing. We come to the table. We're coming and saying, God, thank you for your body that was broken so my body doesn't have to be broken anymore. That healing for my body and spirit comes from the broken body of Christ. I thank you and I adore you for it, God. Then it says he took the cup, and I don't have time to teach all that to you. You can go listen to it. We've done a series on the four cups before, but every Passover, the Jewish people still do it. There are four cups that they have to go through in their ritual. And Jesus, it said, took a new cup. He said, now this is a new cup. Those four cups are not needed anymore. I'm the fulfillment of all four of those cups. Here's the new cup, a new covenant I'm making with you, that my blood will be poured out as a sacrifice for your sins. So every time you take the cup, adore me, worship me, and remember, I paid the price that you couldn't pay. So when we come to the table, it is a positioning of adoration for God. Thank you for your broken body. Thank you for your blood that was poured out for us. We come to the table and we take and remember him and worship him. So here's how we're going to do it. We're all going to come to the table. We have gluten-free bread. In Jesus' name, we don't need you getting sick. Come on, if you have a gluten issue. Um, there's options here. We're going to come from the first row up, and you'll circle your way back. Just follow back in when the row in front of you is gone. Don't take your elements. We're going to share them together. But just come to the table. The band's going to be playing softly. Let me pray over you. God, we love you. Thank you that you 
are worthy of all the praise and worship and adoration. God, we give it to you this morning. As we come to the table, we come postured in a position of worship and adoration to you, God. Thank you that your body was broken. Thank you that your blood was poured out for us. We love you, Jesus. We worship you in adoration. Amen. Come to the table. You can stand and follow in the row behind you.